I'm Pastor Chris Lee, pastor here. I'm just glad that you are with us. This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us do what? Rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, can we give God a hand clap of praise? I know some of us are giving in the offering, but let's just thank him for who he is. Amen. I'll give a special shout out to the people in the balcony, the people in the balcony. Can y'all make some noise real quick? Man, it sounds like it, was, it might be more than what I can see. So um, we're, we're grateful. Um, so now all of you all know there is a balcony where you can sit up there and not get a splinter. This is finished space, so thank you guys for being, um, being here with us this morning. So good to have you all. Um, many of you all may not know, but our church is largely populated by college students. About 35 to 40% of our, uh, of our congregation is comprised of college students. And so this is the season where college students are returning, and we're excited to see you come back from summer break, missions trips, and all that good stuff. If you're a college student, can you make some noise real quick, real quick? <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. Good to have you guys. Always, you're welcome here. We started as a campus ministry. College is uh, college students and campus ministry is, a, is near and dear to our heart. We believe in having one foot on the campus and one foot in the community. Um, and uh, generation after generation of college students continue to make that possible. Um, we were told when we started um, by a couple of folks, you can't, you can't start a church with college folk. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. God wanted to do something in not tomorrow's leaders, but today's leaders. And so we're grateful that we get an opportunity to invest, encourage, and bring people towards Jesus, um, even when in, in that critical moment of young adulthood and, uh, and college and campus life. Um, and so we're grateful to have you all back. Also, we are in a series called House Party. Everybody say, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Awesome. We're in this series called House Party, and we are, uh, I don't know if y'all know, but it's some, we got many distinctives. But this, this, look, we preach, we party, and we pray. We're going to preach hard, we're going to pray hard, we're going to party hard. And so we like for Sunday morning to feel like a party when you come in. Um, we like to be able to celebrate because it says, uh, even in the Bible, it talks about how there are parties in heaven uh, when one sinner repents. Uh, and so we believe that church and worship together should be very vibrant, should be energetic, it should be challenging and encouraging. Um, that's, that's what we believe and that's how we try to practice it. This house party series is to help us focus on some distinctives for us as a church. And I'll get into a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, and so as we talk about these distinctives, we recognize that uh, there was a study done of our congregation, of our demographics, about 70 some odd percent of the people who attend our church, this was done in March, who attend our church, about 70 some odd of the people um, had only attended our church 12 months or less, 70, over 70 percent of the people in March and April, over 70 percent of the attenders or the people who come to church had attended our church uh, for 12 months or less. That means most of the people that you see have been here 18 months or less. Um, now that's exciting because that shows that we are a growing church. Somebody say amen. amen. And also too we recognize that um, just like a good bush around good soil, it will grow but sometimes you still got to trim it and make sure it has the right shape. Um, maybe I'm saying that because at my house there's some, uh, there's some greenery that's running away and not given the proper maintenance it will become something that you did not plan for it to become. And so we recognize we want those who come into our church to know what it means to be a part of Divine Unity Community Church. Uh, yes, we are Christ-centered. We are called, connected, committed. But over these past few weeks, we've been talking about we are a praying church. Everybody say pray. pray. We are a hungry church. Somebody say more bread. More bread. We also are a loving church. Everybody say love. love. And today we're talking about we are a generous church. Everybody say we are generous. And next week, we'll close it out by, by talking about we are a growing church. Everybody shout, grow. And so um, we're going to be talking about uh, we are a generous church from Exodus chapter 36, verses 2 through 7. Exodus chapter 36, verses 2 through 7. Now, we know participation is better than observation, so may you rise to your feet as we read the word of God. I want to give you uh, a quick word that uh, there are two names that may be hard to pronounce. So I'm going to read verse 2. And then you come in with verse 3. Y'all got it? Because if you read verse 2 and you mess up the name, that means all of us embarrassed. Let's just let one person be embarrassed. I'm going to step out on faith and pronounce these names. Then with verse 3, y'all come in strong, okay? Come come with the kick drum. That's what I want y'all. I want y'all. 
I want y'all to come in strong and help me out. The word of the Lord reads, So Moses summoned Basileel and Ahalib and every skilled person in whose heart the Lord had placed wisdom, all whose heart, all whose hearts moved them to come to the work and do it. Everybody, they took from Moses' presence all the contributions that the Israelites had brought for the task of making the sanctuary. Meanwhile, the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. Then all the artisans who were doing all the work for the sanctuary came one by one from the work they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than is needed for the construction of the work the Lord commanded to be done. After Moses gave an order, they sent a proclamation throughout the camp. Let no man or woman make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. So the people stopped. The materials were sufficient for them to do all the work. There was more than enough. Verse 7 is where our focal point is. They stop because the people have made so much they received sufficient material to do the work. And then here's our title, topic, subject, and focus this morning. More than enough. Everybody say more than enough. Somebody shout, there's more. Awesome. You may be seated. As we talk about more than enough and being a generous church, we'll see what motivated these people to give more than enough to the work of God. We'll see the tabernacle, the testimony, and the timing. The tabernacle, the testimony, and the timing. With that being said, let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be before you. And God, now, as we uh, open up this word, God, we believe we have come to have a seat at your table. Thank you for inviting us to be able to sup with the bread of life. And God, we ask that you will bless this spiritual meal for the nourishment of our bodies and our souls and our minds and our hearts. God, we also thank you, God, for this opportunity to be together. God, may we cherish these corporate moments, God, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that your supernatural power will rest, rule, and abide in this place. God, we thank you for this opportunity. And God, I pray, even as I preach, Lord, that no flesh glories in your presence. God, that the words that come out of my mouth, Lord, may they be echoes of heaven. God, I pray that the words in my mouth and the meditations of my heart are acceptable in your sight. I surrender to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. More than enough. In Luke chapter 19, verse 46, giving a little bit more scriptural background to our sermon series, House Party, Luke 19, verse 46, Jesus walks into the temple, into the sanctuary, to the church of that day, and the people were in there, and they were, they were gambling. They were, selling, they were selling messed up sacrifices. They were charging people the raw stuff and Jesus he gets upset he flips the tables and says this should be a house of prayer because he recognizes when people come in it should be for the work of God more than anything else and even as we are in this series this is about us making declarations over our house as to who we are and what this house is meant to be about when I look at Joshua 24, Joshua stands before the children of Israel and he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And we want when people come into this church that they know what we're about. And we want people when they come in this church that they know that we are Christ-centered. We're about the work of God. That we are called by God, connected to the people of God, committed to the work of God. We want, we want people to know that divine unity is not just our name, but it's our strategy and it's also our mission. We want people to get that moment and feel that when they come in every Sunday. We say, welcome home, family. Welcome home, family. We don't say that facetiously, and, and we don't say that just, to, just, just so it would be some cool rhetoric. No, we say that because we want people to get that sense. I don't know what your home was like, but I can speak for mine. I know when I go home, even to this day, I'm still the baby boy. I can bring Chip and Chloe, my son and daughter, but I'm still the baby, and sometimes I got to let them know that. You got to let them know before they were Gigi and Papa, they were my mama and daddy. Okay? Gwen's going to make my favorite meal before she make your pancakes, Chloe. That's a true story. 
And so there's a special thing about home. When you come home and you're around people who love you, this is how God, this is how God de- uh, designed it. That when you're around people who love you, you are edified. You are encouraged. Your insecurities are, are washed away. You feel covered. You feel secure. You feel protected. And so when you come in to this church and we say, welcome home, family. We know people are coming from many different backgrounds, many different ethnic backgrounds, many different socio- socioeconomic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. And we know people are coming from all these different facets of life, but we still say welcome home. Why? Because we serve a God that welcomes us into his family. And we want to extend that love every Sunday, every moment. The doors are open. When you come in, we want you to feel like truly I'm a brother and a sister. Truly, we might look different from afar, but God has united us to make one new person. Through the blood of Jesus, we recognize at the end of the day, we all can folk because we got that same blood that saved us all. Amen. And so when we look at, so when, so when we say welcome home family, we want people to come in and, and, and not just come in just to, just to get something, but come in to, 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 to give something as well because participation is better than. Because a good functional home, I don't know where you can find this in, in, in psychological writing or academia, but I know a good home requires us to have some chores from time to time. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, I, I know I've told this story before. See, when I was at home, I felt welcome, I felt secure, but also I had the fear of God in my heart by my father. My dad would come in the house and I would make sure that I did the chores that he left me to do, and I did a couple extra ones too out of fear. Not trying to kiss up, my dad walk in the house, I'm like, hey, oh, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and empty this trash. Son, ain't no trash in there. You right, you right. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and wash these dishes. Why are you washing clean dishes? I mean, you walked in the house. You tell me. <laughs> and uh, and there, there was a moment, that, but, but I began to get excited. I remember the first time my dad let me cut the grass, let me get on the ride lawnmower. Now I pushed the lawnmower plenty of times. He let me get on the ride lawnmower. That was a moment. I mean, the first time he let me change the oil, he let me start contributing. I remember my, the first time my mom taught me how to fry chicken. That's a rice of passage. Even though I eat chicken now, I still remember. Like, there's something. There's something unique when you get an opportunity to contribute. You're no longer just watching. You get an opportunity to participate. And when I think about us being a generous church, we don't want our generosity just to be from, from uh, we don't want our generosity just to be from, just from a few people. We want the generosity to flow throughout the entire church. Why should we be a generous church? Because we serve a generous God. Now, you're going to hear the scripture probably again at the end, but in Ephesians chapter 2, it says, God, who was rich in mercy, he was rich in mercy. He loved us while we were yet sinners, Romans 5, 8. He talks about while we were yet sinners, he died for us to be able to bridge this gap. We serve a generous God. Therefore, we should be a generous people. Y'all don't sound convinced yet. Because what you recognize is that whatever God blesses you with, whatever he puts in your life, basic stewardship says this, it should be multiplied, it should be cared for. If God blesses you with encouragement, that means there should be somebody else that is encouraged. If God blesses you with a piece of wisdom, that means you're supposed to pass that on. I live by principle, my life is worth nothing until I give it to somebody else. And that follows every pattern of my life. My finances are worth nothing until I give it to God and give it to somebody else. My kindness is worth nothing until I give it to God and give it to somebody else. Whatever God gives you, you are both a vessel and a funnel. When God gives it to you, you're supposed to bless and turn back to somebody else. Now, not only individually, but I want us to hear this thing collectively. Now, now, because about 70% of y'all well, haven't been here that long, that's fine, that's good, that's good news. And let me tell you a little bit of a story. I'm a little bit of a historian around here. I've been here since the Genesis. Okay, I've been here since the beginning, okay? I've been here since the beginning of Divine Unity Community Church, and that's been a long six and a half years, y'all. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be able to say that when it's six. I'll be like, look, y'all, I've been around here for a while. Don't y'all mess with me, go on now. I don't know why I feel like I'm going to be that type of guy. <laughs> 60 years from now, I'll be 90. Y'all don't know. I still got to shout at me. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Let me go ahead and sit down. All right. So anyway. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. So let me, let, me, let me tell y'all a little bit about the history, okay? Because we started as a campus ministry. We started as a campus ministry. And when we, when we moved into our first building, 182 Neff Avenue. How many of y'all been to Neff Avenue? Hey, yeah, yeah, Neff. Boy, Neff was, a, Neff was a sweat box. It was like a sauna. It was sauna worship. You know what I'm saying? We ain't had no, look, when we first started, we ain't had no one bathroom. And so one person said, oh, this is the church of holding. <laughs> you'll get it. You'll get it. You'll get it. 
<laughs> we had what the board, but we were worshiping. I'm telling you, the stage, the stage was about, the, the, the sanctuary was this size. <laughs> the stage was like the size of the monitor. But, uh, but, but anyway, we, we were so joyful. I remember when we first moved in, uh, there was another church that they, 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 uh, they were moving out. And so we, we got the chairs from them. And the church was like, man, we're here. We have set, we had 75 chairs, not 75. We had 75. 75 chairs. We had 75 chairs, and we was excited. We were excited about those maroon chairs. And then somebody said, look, that's not enough chairs, because when we had our first service, we were like, we just, wanted, we just wanted some people to come, and then for them to be willing to come the next week. We didn't know if we had to pay people to come or not. We were willing, <laughs> but we was like, we wanted people to come. So people, so the first, so we borrowed some chairs from Grace Covenant of Harrisonburg, and they were like this real light purple pink. They were pink. I ain't, I ain't know the chairs were pink or not. So, they were, so we got these pink chairs, and we borrowed about 50 of them. And, and so we had, we had about 125, 130 some odd chairs, and we were like, oh, man, this is great, man. We got plenty of space. Now, now the first Sunday when we kicked off, February 5th, 2012, February 5th, it was cold outside, and, and we sitting in the office, and I done prayed, and this is the first time I'm preaching as Pastor Chris Johnson. I'm nervous as all get out. We ain't had number one bathroom, so I had to make sure I was good. Anyway. <laughs> And so, and so I'm looking at Pastor, so, so, so Pastor AJ is the executive pastor, like he's administrator, you know, to be on time is to be late, you know, so his service supposed to start at 10, and AJ is like, listen, bro, we're going to start on time, we're not going to follow this motif, people going to know, we're going to start on time, you're going to find the motif in a second, so, and, and, and so, and, and so, and, and so, so here it is, so, and so I'm, I'm sitting in the office, I pray real deep, you know, I got my deep holy prayer in, and so now, I'm just waiting, and service ain't start, I look, it's about 10 o'clock, then it's about 10.05, AJ comes in the office, he don't look at me. He comes and grabs chairs. I say, AJ, why we ain't started yet? Man, this is our first Sunday. We got to set a precedent. We don't want people to think that we start on CP time. <laughs> you don't know what CP time, color people time. <laughs> Different cultures. We show up at certain times. We flow with it. <laughs> Cookout started at 5. I'll be there at 6.30. And when I get there at 6.30, the food still better be hot. And the, and the space game ain't started till I got there. Let me stop. Let me stop. <laughs> hey, we multi-ethnic, multicultural. Come on, family. Right. And so I was like, man, we can't start CPT. We can't start CP time. You know, on, on, on the first day, AJ said, listen, listen. You know, AJ, he got a little fuss in him. I think it was passed down. <laughs> I'm sorry. And so, and so, and so AJ, said, AJ said, listen, we ain't got no more seats. I said, what? So he grabs the couch. The two guys come in. It's like a moving company that comes in, moving the couch out, this, out the office and, you know, the chairs and stuff like that. So I'm just pacing because my chair gone. <laughs> At this point, my whole, my worship list went from all this, you know, all this Shekinah glory and holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, they just represent, get crow. Because now I'm trying to get my energy right. And so I'm in there like it's pregame. I ain't got no seat. I might as well hop around. Anyway, so I come out. People stand up around the walls. The, the, the windows are fog and sweaty and all this stuff. And we had these two different color chairs. And then here's the thing. Uh, fr from then, it almost became like a, 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 a trend for us. Two things. We will have a packed house and we won't have matching chairs. Family, let me tell you, we have, people have been generous to us. We borrowed chairs since our, since our existence, even to the point, fam, see, y'all don't even know the blessing. I'm going to tell you the blessing you're sitting on right now. The blessing you're sitting on right now is another church gave us these chairs, and when they first gave them to us, we only had 300 when we moved in, and guess what we kept? We had a multi-ethnic background. We had maroon, we had purple, we had burgundy, and we had multicolored chairs. This is only the second Sunday in our entire existence. We've had all the same color chairs in the sanctuary. <laughs> Look, we celebrate that. Because you got to understand, I think we did the math one time. I think the chairs, the chairs were probably worth about $75,000 worth or something like that. $7,500. All of them. It was a lot. It was a lot. That's, it was a lot. And so here it is. But, but look, another church, they built a brand new sanctuary. They had the cool stadium seats. And because I'm from Ivor, Virginia, I know how to, I got a little hustle in me. They call me Bob, ball on a budget for a reason. And I'm looking at them, I'm like, man, y'all got about 600 chairs. Not 600, 600. That's a difference. Y'all understand the mindset. I was like, listen, we about to move. I was like, well, hey, uh, Pastor, <clears throat> what y'all doing with them chairs? So I think we're going to have them used. Let me, let, me, let me get a few of them there. Let me, let me hold some. And then, lo and behold, God continued to bless them, and they continued to bless us. 
And so we continue to receive blessings like that over and over and over again. We have been, God has expressed his generosity to us through very tangible means. And I think it's important that we express our generosity to others through tangible means as well. Amen. Amen. And just to give you a little bit of background, we have, we have, we have determined uh, for the past uh, yeah, six years that we will give 10% of all the income that comes into the church. We want to be able to sow that somewhere. And if we're a part of a larger movement and we get a chance to partner with church plants, um, we get a chance to partner with, uh, with, with world missions and campus ministries all across the world. And so to date, to the day, just this year in 2018, we've already given over $70,000 away, family. Come on, celebrate that. Maybe, maybe, that's still, maybe that's still not big to you. You got to understand, when we first started, we said by faith that the budget for the first year would be $100,000. And I believe this year will be the first year we will outgive what we used to get. You see what I'm saying? And that's the, that's the joy. When God blesses you, it should multiply. And so when I look at this, I, I, I see that we are to be a generous church because God has been generous to us. Now, I want to give you, I want to take you on a, on, on a little journey with the children of Israel and how God had to mold them from taking them from being consumers to contributors, from allowing them to do what we're trying to do this year, which is build and partner with God. Everybody say build. So when we talk about partnering with God, we're talking about we're going to be faith-filled and faithful. We're going to be dependent on God, and we're, going to be and we're going to be diligent about the work of God. And so the children of Israel, they find this moment in Exodus chapter 36 where you never hardly hear this happen, where they took up a free will offering, and the people brought so much. They made so much stuff that they had to tell them to stop, and they said it was more than enough. Everybody shout more. It was more than enough. What, how, why did these people give the way they gave? Why did they give in such an abundant mindset with such an abundance, even though they were in a wilderness, they just got free from slavery. It's not like they had an inheritance that was just stacked up, but they came and they gave all of what they had and all of what they had was more than enough for the work that the Lord had called them to. I think there's something there. When you take what you have and put it in God's hands, he'll always press it down, shake it together and cause it to be running over. When you put what you have in God's hands, a value meal can feed 5,000. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? We serve a God that multiplies and you can't beat God's giving so you never lose when you give to him. And so we find in this moment in Exodus, in the book of Exodus, and literally that's the exit for the children of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. And so when you talk about the Exodus story, this is a story about a people who learn who God is and who learn who they are. It's a story of a people about them learning who God is and learning who they are. Family, we are revived lives. We are learning who God is and learning who we are. And so we find the children of Israel they are journeying throughout the wilderness that God gives them an opportunity to partner with him. He tells them in, in Exodus chapter 25 um, verses 1 through 8. I want to read this for you. Exodus chapter 25 verses 1 through 8. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites to take an offering for me. You are to take my offering from everyone who is willing to give. This is the offering you are to receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen, and goat hair, ram skins dyed red and fine leather acacia wood oil for the light for, for, for the lights spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incenses and onyx along with other gemstones mounting on the ephod and the breastplate on the breastpiece of the priest verse 8 it says they are to make a sanctuary everybody say sanctuary they are to make a sanctuary, or you'll see that is used later on in the book of Exodus. A sanctuary is also a tabernacle. They are to make a sanctuary, a tabernacle for me, so that I may dwell. Everybody say dwell. They are to make a space for me. This is God speaking. That I may dwell in their midst. Family, that's good news already. That the creator of heaven and earth, desires to be close to us. See, you got to understand the story. 
See, in the book of Genesis, when God created all of heaven and earth, when God, when, um, yeah, when, God, when God created heaven and earth, when he created earth, understand that he created man and put him in the garden. God and man had perfect unity. There was no sin. There was no issue until Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. They ate of the fruit. Sin entered the world. Sin causes separation. And so before sin, God used to walk with Adam in the cool of the garden. There was sweet fellowship. God dwelt with man. And so once sin entered in, you see throughout the Old Testament all the way to Jesus and then into heaven that God has been working a plan that he might be able to dwell with us again. That's good news. We don't deserve to be in the presence of a holy God, but yet he still pursues after you. I want to encourage somebody. You might have messed up last night. You might have messed up this summer, college student, but guess what? God still wants to be close to you. You might have came in here this morning and you might say, well, I failed on my fast. I don't feel that righteous. I don't feel right. You might be feeling condemned, but let me tell you the truth. God wants to give you an opportunity that he might be able to dwell with you. you oh, you still don't believe me? I'm glad you don't. Here it is. When he was born, they said his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so you find that this word tabernacle, tabernacle. See, this is the vision that God had given Moses and the people. He says, let them build a sanctuary. Let them build a place where I may dwell. I want to dwell with my people. Now, now, now this is cool because the fact that God wants to dwell with them lets them know that there's still hope. The fact that God wants to dwell with them. Because when God is dwelling with you, there is protection. When God is dwelling with you, there is provision. When God is dwelling with you, there is promise. When God dwells with you, there, all of his abundance comes with him. Because in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so we find in Exodus 25, he says, they are to make a sanctuary for me. They, 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 the people. The people, I want to draw them closer so they know that every little thing that they give, that when they give it together, that we'll be better together. Let me tell you about this thing called synergy. Synergy is when two different things come together to make a third party. And when synergy happens, understand that it always multiplies the impact of the two parties coming together. There's this one story about an ox pulling context. They used to do these in the early 1800s. And so they would have different yoke of oxen that would pull certain amounts of weight. And so the first place oxen yoke pulled 15,000 pounds. The second place uh, oxen, uh, yoke of oxen pool, 10,000 pounds. And so then somebody had a wonderful idea. They said, well, let's put wagers on the table to see if we can bind the two yoke of oxen together, see how much they can pull. Now, we got 15,000 and we have 10,000 pounds. And so some people said, well, 25,000, that's basic math. Then somebody else said, well, they might pull a little bit more, 30,000. Then somebody else said, well, look, I'm going to go up one more, 35,000. When they hooked them up together, the yoke of oxen together, one pulled 15,000, one pulled 10,000. But when you put together they doubled their capacity and pulled 15,000 pounds what we want to be able to create in our church is a holy synergy that whatever we put our hands to because we're doing it together we'll double the impact do y'all hear what I'm saying we'll double that we'll double the weight that we're able to carry can I get an amen and so that's what synergy does divine unity is not just our name it's not just our mission it's our strategy we're better together and so God told them Build a sanctuary. I need, he says, I need all of you all to join together in a project that advances the kingdom. And so when we find in Exodus 25, this word tabernacle continues to, to resonate within me because God wants them to be able to build a tabernacle where his presence can dwell. Now, here's the thing about the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the instructions that God gives Moses in Exodus 25 um, through Exodus 30, uh, through Exodus 31, he gives them instructions about how to build the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, even to the, it's like all these little details, how long the curtain should be, with the materials that should go on the Ark of the Covenant, which is the Holy are holies. He goes through all these details what type of bowls they need to wash in what type of material needs to be there. He goes through all of those details because this is what's happening. God is giving Moses and the people a snapshot of heaven. Mm. That's, that's when you do something like this. Mm -hmm. See he's giving them a snapshot of heaven because the way the tabernacle was structured is how God is saying this is how heaven is structured. And so when he's giving them the tabernacle details he's saying when you get this you'll get a snapshot of heaven. When you get a snapshot, it's just like getting a postcard. 
I go to a beautiful place. I go somewhere like Hawaii, right? And I go somewhere and I get a nice postcard and I give you the postcard and it has this beautiful scenery. And what it does is it makes you want to go too. Right? Amen? Y'all follow me so far? Which means you put this postcard on your, on your refrigerator and you say hashtag goals. See, a postcard gives you a snapshot of a place that creates a longing and a hope that one day you'll be able to see. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on, come on. So then when God gives them a snapshot of heaven and they see that they can be forgiven of their sins with their sacrifice as they come in the tabernacle and they can dwell with him and he can dwell with them. Now they're getting a snapshot and they're saying one day this is what we're going to do all the time because the snapshot create a holy longing. So he gave them the tabernacle so they can build a place where they can dwell. And so when we talk about the tabernacle, that means dwelling place. That means dwelling place. In John chapter 1, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It means that he tabernacled among us. He dwelt with us. And so God has given them an opportunity that God may be able to dwell with them. Let me help you out a little bit more. See... What we're talking about in that, in, that, in that essence is when we talk about the tabernacle of the Old Testament, oftentimes that's a good picture of the local church in the New Testament. That with the work of Jesus, he's given us opportunity to come together corporately. And then what he's saying when two or three are gathered in my name, come on some church folks. He says, I'll be there in the midst. Y'all hear what I'm saying? It says that God inhabits, do y'all hear the Bible? God inhabits the praises of his people. So when we come together corporately, two or three gathered in his name, when we lift up his name, He's going to inhabit the praises and he tabernacles with us. And we begin to get a tangible sense of his Shekinah glory. We begin to get a tangible sense of his presence. It's not because we sing well. It's not because we preach well. No, it's because God fills this room with his presence. We have testimony after testimony. People come in the doors and they say, I just wept the entire service. Why? Because it's years of hurt. It's years of pain. It's years of weight that's being lifted in the presence of God. We ask God to show up. And that's one thing we've been favored with before there was big lights before there was a big stage there was a big presence he wants to tabernacle with us when you come in let his power let his presence let it heal you let it encourage you let it strengthen you he's welcoming you in here welcome home family welcome to the place where you can be freed because wherever the spirit of the lord is there he is So he says, I want to tabernacle with you. And I'm giving you an opportunity to partner with me. I want you to partner with me in my tabernacling with you. If you build it, I will come. And so we find that God gave them an opportunity. God has given us an opportunity. Since the genesis of this church, we've been walking on faith. We signed a lease for our first building before we had a congregation. But we believe, God, you called us to this. And God, we're going to show up. And unless you don't want it to happen, that's the only way it won't happen. But it will not not happen because we have a lack of faith. We believe without faith it's impossible to please God. And so we follow that same pattern. I remember in November 2016, about a group of 25 of us came to this very place. And we began to pray. It was empty. And we began to wonder, God, is this the place that you have for us? We went back and we prayed more. And one of our elders said, listen, are you going to have faith or not? Don't worry about the deal. Don't worry about the finances yet. Will you step out and trust God? And there was a resounding yes. Was it fearful? Yes, but I'm glad perfect love cast out all fear. We came here by faith. See, I was raised up on an old song. We come this far by faith, leaning on the Lord. And so when you talk about having a faith-filled journey, what you recognize is faith invites God to be active in your life. And so we, so we came here, we prayed, and we moved in, and we wondered, was it going to be too big? We wondered, was it going to be too big? We wondered if it was going to be too big. Look around. Look around. No, God knew. He says, if you build it, I will fill it. We didn't do, we didn't do no fancy schemes and, and, and marketing and stuff. Actually, we pulled back because we didn't have enough money. We was like, you know what, God, we're going to use social media, we're going to wear shirts, and we're going we're gonna to pray, we're going to preach, and we're just going to try to impact people. We're going to take the city with the gospel, we're going to flip it upside down, and then the people come, they come, and look at this, all of us are part of that testimony. All of us are part of that testimony. Some way you participated, even if you didn't know it. Welcome home, family. You might not even know you contributed yet, but yes, you contributed. God desired 
to be among us. He desires to be among us. That's one thing we got going. We, similar to Moses, Moses prayed a prayer, Exodus 33. He says, Lord, if you don't go, we don't want to go. And that's what we pray. Lord, 1680 Country Club Road looks like a great building, 55,000 square feet, just waiting to be established, waiting to be purchased. And that looks good. But here's the thing, God, if we go there and we have a packed crowd and you're not there, we don't want to go. We only want, we want to be where you are. And God, are you telling us to go? And we felt the Lord command us to go. And just like Moses, he gets a command in the scripture. And God says, look, tell them build a sanctuary. And here it is. We showed up. And God has continued to bless us. And so here it is. We find this moment where, where God has brought us to a place to tabernacle among us. And see, what you see right here is 25,000 square feet finished, not just in the sanctuary, but our children's space in the balcony and a multi-purpose room. That's what you see. But there's 33,000 square feet behind me waiting to be established, waiting to be a resource to the city. Pretty much what we're doing, we're digging, we're digging a heavenly well so that the city will be able to come and be able to drink of the living water. That's what we want. We started one to minister to the city, and we're going to keep on pressing in. And so when you think about some of the things we want to do, many people don't even know about the warehouse in the back that's just waiting for us to purchase the building so we can fill it out. Here's some of the things that we imagine, imagine, what if we're able to do some of the things here? Some of the things we want to do, we want to create an alternative education center where people, where, where, where uh, there might be troubled teens or people who might not be able to be in public school. We want to be able to give them a space to be able to get Christian education and discipleship. We want that to happen. We also, we have a strong leadership man on this church we have all types of leaders all throughout here most people don't even know we have two of the former mayors that come to our church every Sunday we have people who are professors vice presidents business owners and stuff like that and they don't carry themselves like they somebody they just know somebody named Jesus we get an opportunity to influence and impact in all these ways. And what we're saying is we believe we're supposed to raise up leaders and put them so we can see systemic change in every area where we can see righteousness and justice roll down. Some of the reform that we need to see in our society needs to flow from soul reform. And once salvation happens, understand we take salvation and the good news. We take the peace of reconciliation everywhere we go. So we want to be developing leaders. Could you imagine leaders from around the state coming in to sit and learn and to be encouraged and be anointed and to be prayed for the new Josephs, the new Daniels, those people that would stand in royal courts but yet still be sought in light. We want to develop an indoor athletic facility. Come on, y'all know we're a competitive church. Right? Athletes is something that we always had. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we had the entire James Madison football team here. But also, uh, last year, we had the same. We had the entire JMU football team here one time. We had Broadway football team here one time. We had Bridgewater's football coach that come in. We have character coaches on the campus. God is giving us an opportunity to impact, influence, and create a safe haven. Yeah. One of the largest ways, one of the largest platforms in our society is sports. One of the largest platforms. You got sports, music, and food. We got, we, there's no meeting, there's no eating. We're going to eat. Now, we're going to jam to some music. Listen, this one guy came to our church one time. This was wild, this was wild back in Neff. Now, I'm going to say this. I hope this don't offend nobody. He, and I don't, know where, I don't know what he was on. This dude looked at me. He was like, hey, pastor. Yo, y'all music is so cool, man. It makes me want to roll a holy blunt and just smoke it while y'all. <laughs> Boy, you real close to Jesus. <laughs> I believe I can fly. You... <laughs> I wish I could make this stuff up. I'm not lying. I don't know what to say with that. Like, thank you. <laughs> but y'all baseline is doing something else. Stan, what, what did you do before you hit that chord? You, you woke something up in them. Mm -mm. I'm sorry. I, it's just people just, but people say stuff like that. But here's the thing. We have music, but we believe sports. And that's a major platform. Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Did I, did I name all of them? Oh, yeah. Uh, Leadership Institute, Alternative Education Center, Duck Education. These are the things. We want to create disciples. That's what God put us here for. And God has given us opportunity to be able to establish this here. Somebody say amen. amen. 
When I look at the ministry that God has been able to bring forth, you go back and you look on our Facebook page or either our website and you look at some of the pictures, man, you can see life entering into people. There's one picture of a baptism moment and you just see people just receiving the renewing of Jesus just all over them. And that's what we want to be able to continue to foster. And that thing takes work. Sometimes it takes finances. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes talent. But I believe when we come together, God will move in our midst. How do I know he's already shown us? He's already doing it. We have a grand opportunity before us. And when you think about the people that Moses was speaking to, they had a testimony about the goodness of God. Just a few chapters earlier, they had, made, they had used their resources to make an idol. They used their resources to make a golden calf. But now we see a shift. There's a revival. There's a reconciliation between them and God. And when this reconciliation happens, something happens after revival. Revival happens and then it's time to build. Everybody say build. So last year we preached and we preached and we prayed for revival. Revival is still happening, but it's time for us to build. It's time for us to solidify some things. It's time for us to partner with God. These people had a testimony of the goodness of Jesus. We have a testimony, we have a testimony of the goodness of God in every arena of our lives and of this church. I was speaking to somebody right after um, first service. Uh, a person came up to me and said, I've been looking for a church like this for a long time. And I'm so glad that we get an opportunity to afford that to people. What people begin to experience is the goodness and the goodness of Jesus. What we are screaming out from the pulpit, what we are screaming out from this church is come taste and see how good. I'm not trying to convince people. I just want them to taste it. Because if you taste his goodness, my God, when you know what it means to be forgiven, when you know what it means to be grateful for mercy that's new every morning, when you know every time you get weak, his grace is sufficient and his strength is perfect, you'll go tell it to somebody else. That's what we want to create. Because a willing heart is a grateful heart. And when we're marked by attitude of gratitude, We'll be willing to make the necessary steps and sacrifices to see to it that somebody else gets, it, gets a chance to experience it as well. Hallelujah. So God told Moses, take up a free will offering. And everybody's heart who is willing, everybody's heart who is willing, everybody say willing. willing. Everybody's heart who is willing. This means that they identify, God, you have done something worth me saying thank you. They are saying, I see the vision, I see the tabernacle, what you're talking about, and whatever I have, I'm going to give it. See, that's the thing. We, sometimes we belittle the things that we have. Remember that little boy? I mentioned earlier, the little boy, all he had was two fish and five loaves, but that fed 5,000 people. Peter just had a little boat, but that became a platform for the Savior, the creator of the universe, to preach from it. All we had was a passion and a vision and a prayer at 9 o'clock p.m. And look at what God is doing. Whatever you have, that's what, that's what God is asking for. Will you trust me with it? Because I truly believe Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask or imagine according to the power that works where? In us. When we partner with God, we'll see him bring overflow in our lives. I remember Psalm 65 11. It changed my life. It changed my life. I remember reading it. I was stuck in an impoverished, scarcity mindset for years. I was afraid of, I was letting money determine my happiness and things like that. But Psalm 65, 11 helped me. It says, he has crowned the year with his goodness. And his paths drip with abundance. He crowned the entire year with his goodness. And I would begin to look around. I said, well, God, versus me staring at the things I don't have, let me find what you have given me. And the more I saw his goodness, it was as if I was getting in his path. And because his path dripped with abundance, family, the more I sowed, the more I came back. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Malachi chapter 3, it says that when we trust him and with the time, he says he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings we won't have room to receive. And the more I partner with God, it's like the more God says, I'll bless you more. The more I get, man, one time we looked up and we saw how much we gave. I said, babe, I don't remember having that much. When we talked about that number, how much we gave as a church, I can't believe that because I remember we didn't have, we, me and AJ deliberated for three hours on buying a baptism that was $3,000 one, one time. Because we didn't know. 
and to see what God has brought us. We're inviting you that the word spoken over this house would be active in your life. As we talk about Project Home, that's the tabernacle God has brought us to. Project Home is our capital campaign to purchase this building, to finish it out. And I believe that you get an opportunity, that we get an opportunity to participate in that today. We're going to give you an opportunity to activate your faith. Everybody with a willing heart. God loves a cheerful giver. Hear me, hear me in this, hear me in this. For some of you all, this might be your first time here. And that's okay. This is a unique Sunday. Welcome to our house party. I'm not saying that you have to give. And maybe you can just come. I'm not saying that you have to. No, 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 no. We, we, this is not a law. But this is an opportunity. It's not an obligation. It's an opportunity. That if you say, you know what, I believe in this. I, you know what, I've received from this. Could you check within your heart. Check within your heart. Check within your life. If somebody shared a testimony with you about how their lives have been changed, about what God is doing through this church, just, just, just check within your heart. If you have a testimony somewhere, that's what I'm saying. Recall that and give freely, freely. Because when you give a cheerful giver, we want you to have joy. We're about to have a celebratory moment. We're going to give to Project Home through a Give a Day Today campaign. I'm going to explain that in a second. But when we give, we want to be having a joyful moment. It's not like, oh, God, I don't want to. No, we want to be like, man, I get a chance to participate in what God is doing. That's what we believe, family. Anybody else excited about participating and partnering with God? So today, we're going to take up a second offering. We're going to take up a special offering in Project Home. Project Home goes towards the purchase of this building and the complete renovations that we need to be the resources for, to be the resources for this city. And we want the testimony of what happened in Exodus chapter 36 that the people gave and it was more than enough. Because check this family. When the people gave, there was a tabernacle that was birthed. When God gave, there was salvation that was given. And so when we give, we get an opportunity to follow the pattern of the Father. Of the Father. So when we say, my soul will follow, let's activate our faith. Um, today and Give a Day Today campaign, you can bring those up, and worship team. Our Give a Day Today campaign, this is what it is, real simple, fun time that we're going to be able to have. We're going to celebrate together while we do this. Now I want you to pray, like I said, find in your heart a testimony or something they will say, you know what, I believe in this. And this is what we're going to do. Give a day today. Out of 365 days, we want to encourage you to come pick a day and give the dollar amount for that day. For instance, January 1st is the first day of the year. That's $1. You come and you can give that $1. Maybe you were born on January 1st and you're saying, you know what, I want to give, I want to give, I want to give to represent January 1st. Man, that's the minimal that you can give. You can pick January 1st because it's a special day and you can give more than that. Maybe you're saying, listen, I was born December 30, de December 31st and I want to give on my birthday and that's 365. I ain't got it today. Don't do it. We're not forcing you. Pick, find, find a place where you can participate because participation is better than and so when we look at it, we have 1 through 90. You'll get your day. Our Project Home helpers will be up here. You'll get your day. You'll go back to your seat. And you'll go back to your seat and you'll fill out. You can, you'll fill it out on the envelope. If you want to give online, if you want to give by cash or check, you can give all the same ways that we give. You fill it out there. Even if you're giving online, we want you to fill it out on the envelope. What day did you pick and what's the amount enclosed? And so that's, that's one instruction. You'll follow the instructions of the ushers. The ushers are going to get, are going to release us row by row. And we're all going to process to your left, my right. And you're going to come around. You're going to find which board you're going to give at. And look, don't be ashamed because every gift counts. And you're going, to, you're going to say, you know what? Here it is. I'm going to find this. I'm going to get this. And you're going to be excited. You're going to be full of faith. You're going to say, you know what? I'm partnering with God. We're believing that God's going to do something great. And if you're a college student, you're going to be sowing a seed into somebody else's life. You're going to say, there's going to be a freshman that's going to come eight years from now. I want them to have a place where they can meet God. Maybe you're a parent and you want to sow into a ministry like that. You, these are the moments. This is how we build our faith. And so whatever it is, you pick your day and then you'll move on forward. We're going to be worshiping and while we're worshiping, you're going to be, we're going to be giving collectively together. And here's the thing. If we have 365 givers and we give that represent a day for each one, we'll double the amount that we saw on the screen for Project Home. 
we'll be able to raise 66,700 and some odd dollars. And that's the joy. We want to see, can we pull our 15 and our 10 together to be able to double the impact? Amen? Anybody excited about that? Anybody excited about an opportunity to be able to give unto the Lord? Come on, family. We're not going to be consumers. We're going to be contributors. We're going to be a generous house because God has been generous to us. So I'm asking that you rise to your feet. Let's rise to our feet as we get ready to worship.